There has been a massive outbreak spreading across America, and it looks like it has a focal or starting point of origination here in this state. And the full list of 11 states have high or very high respiratory illness. Map shows where sickness is spreading. The signs, symptoms, and risks associated with this new mysterious pneumonia. And what is white lung syndrome? Is it fatal? And what can you do to make sure you don't contract this disease that Chinese health officials call out Western media's lack of common sense on country's respiratory illness? The country's National Medical Center for Infectious Diseases says the public does not need to be alarmed. And the CDC says no cause for alarm over spike in respiratory illness in China. A spike in respiratory illness in China has raised questions, understandably so, given where we've been the last three years. The country and WHO, World Health Organization, say the surge is caused by known pathogens. And the CDC says there's no evidence of a new novel virus. But can we really trust all that we are told? Now, the latest from Walmart and a man who is now in police custody and is facing multiple charges following a shooting at Walmart Supercenter in Aiken, South Carolina, over a dispute about money and the latest happening right now between Walmart and the massive changes they just made that will affect millions of people in days. And a look ahead, predictions and forecasting point to energy in 2024 and OPEC cuts and geopolitical tensions driving up oil prices, where we will see oil prices that could reach, get this, $100 a barrel in 2024 if OPEC uh, plus members fulfill pledges for voluntary cuts and how U.S. oil production is a real problem for OPEC, according to top energy analysts. Now, welcome back to Squirrel Tribe. Glad to have you guys here. I am Michelle, your main squirrel, I think is what we're going to go with. People said they didn't like the word host, so Squirrel Tribe leader, I guess we'll go with that. Thank you for being here. For those of you who are coming back, welcome back. For those of you who it's your first time, thank you for joining us. Hopefully you learn something here. You get some knowledge out of what we're going to talk about today. Up to you guys if you want to like the video and subscribe. If not, either way, no harm, no foul. Let's jump in. All right, let's get this show on the road. And first stop, Indianapolis, Illinois. So ju jury orders egg suppliers to pay $17.7 million in damages for price gouging in 2000s. So a federal jury in Illinois has ordered major egg producers to pay a $17.7 million uh, fine, I guess you could say, in damages for conspiring to limit the U.S. egg supply in the 2000s, a figure that triples to over $53 million under federal antitrust law. The jury found that these producers engaged in practices to reduce the domestic egg supply thereby increasing prices between 2004 and 2028. Let me just go ahead and throw in an opinion here real fast. Guarantee in the next couple of years, we're going to see this exact same thing happen where they say this happened between 2021 and 2023. I would bet everything I own on it, which is what we've talked about numerous times over the last few years, that the shortages and the inflation on eggs and chicken is all bull, malarkey baloney, whatever you want to go in there. I'm going to try real hard today to keep adult language at a very low minimum, but no promises. Sometimes those words, they just slip out when I get a little aggravated with what's going on around us. Okay. So anyway, the defendants in the lawsuit included, include CalMain Foods, United Egg Producers, and United States Egg Marketers, and Rose Acre Farms. The plaintiffs are prominent food manufacturers like Kraft Foods Global, the Kellogg Company, General Mills, and Nestle USA. Now the jury concluded that the egg suppliers limited supply by exporting eggs, reducing the number of chickens through various means and other actions. Despite the verdict, all defendants have denied the allegations uh, with some planning to appeal. Well, of course they're going to deny it. It doesn't, not, not like they're going to get caught and go, yeah, you're right. We did it because then you've lost all future trust for these companies as well. And if they were to say, yeah, you're right. We did it. Then they're going to look at everything that happened before 2004 and after 2008 also. So of course they have to continue with the, no, we didn't do that. Although we all know they probably did do that. Now, Roseacre Farms and CalMain Foods have both expressed their disagreement with the jury's decision and are considering legal options, including appeals. The jury was instructed not to consider recent changes in egg pricing. John Rust, who is the former chair of Roseacre Farms 
And surprisingly, or not surprisingly, a current U.S. Senate candidate in Indiana criticized the verdict and his political opponent, U.S. Representative Jim Banks, in the context of this ruling. Rust is also involved in a separate legal battle regarding his eligibility to appear on the Republican primary ballot in Indiana. He faces challenges in his candidacy, with Banks receiving significant endorsements. Rust has labeled the law that might prevent his candidacy as unconstitutional and vague. Now, um, for him to, for John Rust, who was the former chair of Roseacre Farms, to also be running for a chair in the Senate, knowing that you and I know that a lot of these times, these people who are making their ways into these political um, seats have shady backgrounds or have some shady dealings. And sure enough, here you have one of the places where he was a chair of Roseacre Farms. You have that place, that, that company now having to pay millions in fines for falsifying uh, egg production or lack of egg production. Is that really somebody you want sitting on your Senate, uh, Indiana? Just out of curiosity, I would say no if I was in Indiana. Now, do I know a lot about John Russ? No. Maybe he had a come to Jesus moment and he's, you know, turned the wheel and he's doing something different, but I, I don't know. So Indiana, if you guys are here from Indiana, let me know in the comment section. Let us all know how you feel about, uh, Mr. John Rust, if you will. Now, I want to get into the list of the 11 states that have high or very high illness and sickness spreading and the map that shows it all. But first, uh, according to Yahoo Finance Explainer, how climate change is making the world sick. Hmm. This should be interesting, right? Now they say, get this, heat stress and lung damage from wildfire smoke and the spread of disease carrying mosquitoes uh, into new regions as temperature rise are of top concerns. So a quick summary or recap from, and I always butcher their name, Reuters, Reuters, Routers, R-E-U-T-E-R-S. I always get it wrong. I listen to it and then I forget it. So we're going to go with Reuters, okay? Climate change is increasingly impacting uh, public health, a topic highlighted for the first time at the UN Climate Summit COP28. Experts warn that climate-driven health threats could reverse decades of progress in public health with an expected increase in global death tolls by 250,000 per year from 2030 due to malnutrition, malaria, diarrhea, and heat stress as per the World Health Organization, the WHO for short. Vector-borne diseases like den I was going to mess this one up too. Den dengue, D-E-N-G-U-E, dengue, I think that's how it goes. Malaria, West Nile, and Zika are spreading into new regions because of warmer temperatures and heavy rains, creating favorable conditions for mosquitoes. Uh, dengue, den dengue or dengue? Y'all, I suck at pronouncing things. Those cases have risen significantly with Brazil and Bangladesh experiencing severe outbreaks. Malaria cases are also increasing unpredictably with 249 million cases in 2022 alone. Floods in Pakistan led to a 400% increase in malaria and the disease is spreading to previously unaffected highlands in Africa. New malaria jabs I'm expected next year offer hope. But do they though? But do they? Waterborne diseases are proliferating due to storms and flooding. Cholera, which spreads through contaminated food and water, is resurging, with 44 countries reporting cases in 2022. Diarrhea, a major cause of death among children under five, is also being aggravated by climate change. Extreme heat is another direct health impact of global warming, with hundreds of millions at risk. The world has already warmed by about 1.1 degrees Celsius compared to pre-industrial levels, leading to increased days of dangerously high temperatures. If global warming, warming reaches two, deg two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, heat-related deaths could be could more than quadruple. In 2022, sorry, my nose is just, um, Europe experienced heat waves leading to around 61,000 deaths. Wildfires fueled by hotter, drier forests are causing widespread air pollution, a pollution exposing over 2 billion people to unhealthy air from fire smoke. In the United States, this pollution is responsible for thousands of deaths annually. These findings underscore urgent need for effective climate action to mitigate these escalating health risks. Let me just throw in a very unpopular opinion here. It's not that we need to change the climate. We just need to adapt to what the climate is. If you know that in 
third world countries or even, I don't know if second world country is really a phrase. I you only hear, ever hear first world problems in third world countries. But I have to assume that somewhere in the middle of that first world problem, that third world country, you have a second world place, right? And I would think that's what most of these places are going to be. And it's not that you have to, it's the climate change or it's because it's so much hotter, it's because it's this and that. It's because a lot of these places do not have fresh running water. They don't have the system set up for it. You would think that the World Health Organization, I'm sure they have money just falling out their butt and out their ears. There's no way they're not rolling in dough. Or these other billionaires out there who claim to want to make a change in the world, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, everybody else, Bill Gates and, their, and you know whoever else. You, you want to tell me that they can't take their money and actually make a legitimate change and go to these places that are having these massive outbreaks of malaria or dengue, dengue, that sounds right, dengue fever and cholera and everything else and implement a way for them to have clean water, a way for them to have air conditioning, a way for them to have better um, sewer systems so that the streets don't overflow when it rains heavily, so that they have better, just better. Do you know what I'm saying? Like here we are wanting to blame everything on climate change when a lot of it is because of unhealthy living conditions for a lot of people, not because of climate change itself. Is, is it getting hotter? Sure. Is that really everything that's causing the issues? No. It's because there's a ton of people, there's a ton of waste, there's a ton of this, a ton of that. Everything works together. Well, the climate is what it is. But if we could work on a way to make it so that some places are less dirty, so water is cleaner, so people have more food sources, so people have places to live that have a way to get them out of the heat, guess what? You'd have less deaths from heat stress less deaths from dirty water, less deaths from dirty food, from the dirty streets. I don't understand why if we want to be this one happy world, we're not doing everything to make it one happy world. Like it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that the easiest way to fix a problem is to create a solution. I mean, and and that's going to sound some type of way because we know that they've done that <laughs> recently in the past couple of years that Hegelian he dialect, I know I'm saying that wrong, create a problem, get a reaction, offer a solution. Well, technically the solution they want to offer to this problem of climate change is they want to make it so that we have to go green. We have to quit doing this, quit doing this. Everybody has to stay indoors and all this other stuff. Well, no, that's their solution after we're reacting to the fact that all these things are happening. A better solution would be to make it so that these things don't happen to begin with, not to change every single thing um, car wise and whatever else, but give these people who are having these issues the most places to, to live where it's clean water to clean water to drink, clean streets. Like, like, again, all the money that they're throwing at nuclear power plants here in the United States, uh, Bill Gates, all the money that they're throwing at hydrogen um, trains and um, electric vehicles and batteries and stuff, all that money they're throwing at that could easily fix the water system for every third world country out there or second world country out there. But instead we're focused on technology that, that's going to pay them more. They're not worried about your life or mine, your health or mine. They're worried about the dollars in their pockets. So don't let them confuse you or, or, you know, pull the wool over your eyes or trick you when they say it's climate change. And that that's why we need to make all these changes. No climate change. Sure. Maybe it's a real thing in, in the extent of everything. Obviously the climate is going to change. It changes every single freaking day. It's not like it's going to always stay the same. If that was the case, we wouldn't have had dinosaurs, ice age, volcanoes wouldn't erupt, whatever else. But at the end of the day, they don't want to find a solution to it. They want to create a solution that's going to then put money into their pockets. So let's not, let's not forget that when we have these kind of conversations. Now, I guess now wouldn't be no better time than uh, ever to mention how uh, it snowed in Hawaii this week, but that's not unusual, okay? A lot of people don't realize that it still snows in Hawaii. Yes, it's supposed to be this nice, gorgeous place, but it's snowed in Florida before. It also gets really hot in the same places where it snows up north. Like, it, it is what it is. You're never going to have the exact same climate, maybe Antarctica, but even in Antarctica, I'm sure it doesn't snow every single day of the year or at the South Pole? Polar bears are at the South Pole, North Pole, North Pole. That's where Santa lives. So I have to assume that the North Pole is the one that's the coldest. Y'all, you would think I would have this information in my head, but I got way too much stuff happening up here to remember everything. Please don't judge me. Now, um, what do we got here? Now, does the weather and the unpredictability of the forecast and changes to the climate play a role in why all of a sudden so many people are getting sick and not just people, animals too? 
We're inundated. Animal shelters across the U.S. are overflowing. But even more concerning is the latest that I read from this NBC News headline, what's causing severe respiratory illnesses in dogs. Veterinarians say there could be a number of reasons for the uptick in cases of atypical canine respiratory disease, including declines in vaccination rates. Now, what they're saying is how veterans and scientists are investigating a surge in severe respiratory illnesses among dogs across the U.S. and Canada. This outbreak, marked by a significant number of cases leading to pneumonia, differs from typical canine respiratory illnesses. I've talked about this a, a few times before, but I want to give you a little bit more information. The illness has various potential causes. One, according to them, is the decline in jab rates among dogs during the pandemic, which may have reduced their resistance to infections. Another possibility is the emergence of a new, more uh, virulent, virulent pathogen. Scientists at the University of New Hampshire have identified a novel bacterium in a small sample of cases, but further research is needed for confirmation. This disease affects dogs of all ages and breeds, with some young, healthy jab dogs experiencing severe symptoms, even requiring ventilation. About 75% of the dogs in a cluster of cases at Texas A&M School of Veterinary Medicine tested positive for known pathogens, but in 25% of cases, no pathogen was detected. Now, common symptoms of this respiratory infection include coughing, sneezing, and red runny eyes. While many dogs recover on their own, those with severe symptoms like difficulty breathing or loss of appetite require veterinary care. The cost of treatment for severely Ill, Ill dogs can be substantial. Y'all, I hope you're ready for this. Ranging from $15,000 to $20,000. Veter veterinarians emphasize the importance of owners recognizing early signs of illness in their dogs and seeking prompt veterinary care if symptoms worsen. The outbreak highlights the need for continuous monitoring and research to better understand and combat emerging health threats to pets. Now, I know a lot of people have dogs, cats, rabbits, snakes, um, whatever else. I can't even think of all the other different hamsters, ferrets. Every There's a lot of pets out there. And during the, you know, planned pandemic, I always, that elf makes its way in there every single time. During the last few years, when people were scared to go into places or when places were closed down and you couldn't go in, or you had to have your own jabbity jab in order to enter a building, or you had to wear something over your face in order to enter a building, it caused a lot of difficulties for people alone but then also you got to think it probably caused a lot of difficulty for the animals. If you could not take your dog or cat or uh, whatever other animal you may have had to the vet because of whatever said rules, maybe that has caused a, um, I don't want to say decline in their health, but maybe there it, it could have something to do with why some of these dogs are getting sick now. However, there's plenty of people out there who have never in their lives thought about injecting their animals or their children or themselves with anything that is, you know, government made. So maybe it's not that, maybe it's something in the air, but I do know that $15,000 to treat a dog or a cat who is coughing and has red eyes, that's a lot of flipping money. Uh, the, the amount of money, y'all, this is probably should not, I know I shouldn't say this here. This needs to be a Patreon conversation before YouTube just completely takes away my entire channel. But the amount of things that could make us sick, severely sick, kill us, whatever else, they just happen to show up in our air, in our food, in our blood somehow, whatever else. It's, it's just so funny to me how expensive it is to get it treated and how it always needs some sort of treatment and how that, that always ends up giving money back to the same people who are supposed to be finding ways to cure the things, but somehow they only find ways to kind of keep the symptoms at bay or whatever else. I have so many thoughts there and I can't really, I can't, we're not allowed to do those kind of things over here anymore because, you know, freedom of speech has gone out the window. Um, let's see, where was I? I'm sorry. Let's go here. Okay, now the Hill is warning everybody that it's not just you. A lot of people are sick right now. Tracking by the Center, uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention show a jump in the number of states experiencing elevated levels of respiratory illness. And they have a map that shows where sickness is spreading. And these 11 states have high or very high respiratory illness. Now the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, because they couldn't put and P in there, would throw off that three letter FBI, CIA, EPA, yeah, CDC. You see the how we go here, gotta have three letters because it, who, you know, it kind of 
WEF. It kind of messes it up if you add CDC and P. But that prevention, I guess, maybe it's not all about prevention for them. So maybe that's why they leave it out. But either way, CDC has observed a significant increase in respiratory illness across the United States, especially following the Thanksgiving holiday weekend. Mm. Just enough information to scare you from wanting to go travel on the Christmas holiday weekend that will be coming up right around the corner here. So keep that part in mind. The CDC surveillance map, I don't like the word surveillance y'all, and tracking and all that other fun stuff. Mm. The CDC surveillance map shows elevated levels of illness in many states with Louisiana and South Carolina categorized as experiencing very high flu activity. States like Alabama, California, Colorado, Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, New Mexico, Puerto Rico, Tennessee, Texas, and don't forget New York City, which technically isn't a state, but it kind of feels like with how many people are jammed into it, are also reporting high levels of respiratory illness. They said it's important to note that the CDC data is based on the number of people reporting to healthcare facilities with flu symptoms, not solely on lab-confirmed influenza cases. So please understand that. I need you to understand that. It's based on the number of people reporting to healthcare facilities, not on the confirmed cases. And this feels real um, deja vu -y, like we've been here before. So many cases of blah, 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 blah. Well, I mean, they're not confirmed. It's just people who thought they might because they coughed once or sneezed weird or farted when they sneezed. I don't know. Not confirmed. But if we only tell you the confirmed number, that's not scary enough. We have to tell you that it's like a lot, a lot. So we're just going to tell you the people who've kind of shown up thinking they had something, not the people who actually had something. Please keep that in mind. Okay. Uh, this means the data may include other respiratory illnesses like C-19 or RSV and could miss cases where individuals choose to stay home and not seek medical care. They can never they can never give you an actual factual number. It is impossible. Please know that. Please understand that. There will never be a confirmed number of anything ever in the history of numbers because there is no way at all to confirm any of these 100%. All right? If five people get sick and only four go to the doctor, but only three of them get tested because the fourth one got tired of waiting and left, you can't have a real number because number five didn't go, number four left, and the other three, they could have had a wonky test. Well, who's that lady who's in jail right now for all of her wonky tests? I don't remember her name, but you know exactly what I'm talking about. Now, the CDC expects this year's respiratory virus season to be within the typical range of severity, similar to last year. However, they acknowledge that even typical seasons can vary greatly in terms of illnesses, hospitalizations, and deaths. Flu jabs are currently available and can be administered alongside a Rona booster. And now they're also pushing for RSV jabs of some sort. Every time I see a commercial, it's like, don't forget to go to your local healthcare provider and get three jabs all at once because you want to be, you know, safe from all of it. Bruh, we all know, we all know that the flu, they put it into your body so that you can fight against it. Like the flu vaccine is not like, do I cannot tell you what to do. I would never tell you what to do with your own body or your own whatever. Just really think about these things before you go do these things, okay? Just, that's all I'm gonna say. Just because I love you is the only reason why I get a little agitated and at stuff like this. So now for those of you who want to know just what exactly this new white lung syndrome is, we talked about it going on in Ohio right now. So white lung syndrome, it is a respiratory illness characterized by white patches in the lungs, which is just here recently emerged as a new health concern, particularly among children. Initially observed in China, this condition has now led to increased hospitalizations in the U.S. and more specifically Ohio. It is believed to be caused by a combination of various respiratory illnesses, including influenza, SARS, COV2, or C19, respiratory sense, oh, these words, RSV, because I can't say since tile, I cannot say the word, S Y N C Y T I A L, since it's seal, nope, can't do it, respiratory, so RSV, don't know why that word's kicking my butt right now and uh, mycoplasma pneumonia. Now, the symptoms of white lung syndrome include cough, fever, fatigue, sneezing, runny nose, watery eyes, wheezing, vomiting, diarrhea, especially in children under five. Health experts suggest that the current outbreak 
might be linked to familiar respiratory viruses rather than a novel pathogen. So far, around 150 pediatric pneumonia cases have been reported in Warren County, Ohio since August, mirroring the outbreak in China. And the condition appears as white patches in the lungs on chest x-rays and is rapidly spreading, hence the term white lung syndrome. And doctors say the symptoms resemble those of influenza and other atypical pneumonia causing bugs, starting with flu-like symptoms and progressing to cough, wheezing, breathlessness, and pneumonia. As far as um, for possible treatment, they are primarily focusing on managing pneumonia symptoms and maintaining respiratory health, including, nope, sorry, yes, including medication for cough and fever and oxygen therapy if necessary. Any suggestions, um, no, sorry, and suggestions per, for preventative measures include good hygiene practices, which feels like a duh, right? Wearing masks, mm, physical distancing, and jabs, vaccinations, especially during the flu season. These are their words, not mine. People are advised to stay home if they exhibit flu-like symptoms and consult a respiratory specialist. Those with chronic respiratory conditions should, should continue their prescribed medications and seek medical review if systems, uh, symptoms change. The outbreak has raised global health concerns and authorities are investigating its exact cause. I had people comment before on previous videos I made where I mentioned the white lung. They're like, well, I don't see it. All right. I didn't like you're not going to see everything from your couch, your living room, your job, your neighborhood doesn't mean you're going to see everything. Ohio is an entire state. I need people to understand that just because it's not happening to your neighbor does not mean it's not happening to somebody's neighbor. OK, they're right now they're saying 150 confirmed cases of kids who have gone in and it has been confirmed. But we just talked about what about the people who have not gone in? What about the people who do not have health insurance and cannot go in because it costs so flipping much just to go to the doctor? Or what about the people who are like, huh, have you seen what the doctors do to people? I'm not going in there. I'm not taking my kid in there. So they don't go. Or the people who are like, listen, I, I think that it's this and we're going to try it at home, try to treat it at home or whatever else. You, you got to understand 150 that they're saying have come in that they can prove have it. How many more out there actually have something along those lines? And like I said, have not gone in because they can't, won't or shouldn't, depending on what your your situation is. But we also have to remember it's this, it, according to them, according to them, it is it mirrors exactly what is happening in China right now. OK, now. We also know how many foreign entities come into this country to start their businesses. China is in Ohio. Um, China is in North Carolina. Vietnam, Vietnam's in North Carolina. Korea's in other parts of the country. Everybody and their mama's somewhere in California. And New York City is a melting pot of everything. So it's it's not uh, unrealistic that something from China has once again been brought or made its way over here because, you know, things travel. That, that's all I got for you. But if you happen to have a child who is sick and getting sicker and it seemed like the flu, but now it doesn't, but you don't think it's the C19, but you don't think it's whatever else. If you have the ability to have them checked out, maybe do so. Or if you know of homeopathic, um, or holistic, homeopathic or holistic. I think those are both like the same thing, right? Ways to take care of them at home. Do so. Um, the, my opinion, not whatever. I'm just saying, I'm, this is not advice. Like advice is what I would do. And then if it gets worse, obviously you should get it checked out, but that's just my, what I would do. So there's that. Now, while the Chinese, um, where am I? Nope. I lost it. Hold on. Here we are. Now, ironically, Chinese health officials are throwing shade on Western media and their apparent lack of common sense on the country spreading respiratory illness. And uh, Chinese health experts are working to reassure the public about the recent spike in respiratory illnesses and are pointing the blame at Western media outlets for disregarding uh, both common sense and facts. Well, the last time that this happened, we had a right to blame the ones that we blamed. I'm just saying. While Chinese Communist Party officials are also denying rumors on social media that the recent surge in respiratory illness is caused by mutations of the Rona or immune deficiency induced by the C19, claiming that the current pathogens are completely different from the COVID pathogen. As I'm going to say, COVID. And I feel like this is a perfect opportunity to plug an SNL weekend update type news report that goes something like this. Okay. If you guys have ever seen the weekend update, you'll know the CCP claims the current pathogens are completely different from the Rona's pathogens. And we know this for a fact because we told Fauci to formulate it differently. 
that's my weekend update. Colin Joe's Michael Che kind of thing, but it's, you know, Michelle Squirrel Tribe. So now, but this is um, from Como News. Health professionals warn of increased illness spread during winter months, which what's new there, right? Health professionals are cautioning about the increased spread of illnesses during the winter months, particularly as temperatures drop and people spend more time indoors for the holidays. They mentioned for the holidays. This is, again, these are notes taken from articles and condensed down and reworded um, to make it like easier to understand sometimes, but still their words. They want, they say indoors for the holidays, which gives you the sense, it's, I think it's designed to trigger something in your brain that says holidays and sickness go hand in hand. That holidays, you should avoid family and friends because the sickness goes hand in hand. It, I mean, you could be in the house on a regular Tuesday afternoon, but it's not talking about that. It's saying over the holidays. And again, it's that subliminal scare tactic in my mind that you have to really notice and pay attention to. Don't let them scare you from seeing your friends and family and living your life. Common symptoms being observed in the community include cough, congestion, and nausea. And there is a slight uptick, according to them, uh, in C-19 cases, which they say is typical for this time of year. And the flu is expected to intensify in midwinter, too. They're both the same damn thing. Now, Denise Lucas from Ohio Valley Health Center notes that the increase in patients during this period is largely due to people being indoors more often, where viral and sometimes bacterial illnesses spread more easily through touch or exposure to contaminated droplets from coughs or sneezes. Lucas also mentions that during these months of celebration, it's important to recognize and accept being sick. She recommends treating symptoms with appropriate over-the-counter medicines like Mucinex, Tylenol, and Benadryl, ensuring they target specific symptoms. In addition to medication, staying home when sick, staying hydrated, consuming soup, and using a cool mist humidifier are also beneficial. Now, the Jefferson County Health Commissioner, Andrew Henry, emphasizes the importance of being mindful during the respiratory virus season, and he advises keeping sick children and the elderly at home and rescheduling gatherings to prevent the spread of illness. But overall, medical professionals advise maintaining good hygiene practices such as washing hands with soap and water and using alcohol-based hand sanitizers to stay safe and healthy during the sick season. Listen, I said it once and I'll say it again, even though I probably should not say it over here, y'all. I keep getting smacked for these kind of things. Um, do I want to say it? F it. I'm still going to say it. I've said it before. When, <laughs> oh, how do I do this where I won't get hurt from the algorithm and, and the, the YouTube police? Um, when people were told or asked politely, obviously, to stay not outside, but to stay inside for two weeks or longer at a time and to cover their face and to do all these things, all it really did was help deteriorate your immune system, just break it down and break it down and break it down. And then once everything opened, people went back out, of course, there's going to be a new surge of whatever else. And in the holidays, I don't know why they always want to target the holidays for these things. It's always Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's Eve. Oh, be careful. Everybody stay home and stay separated and whatever else. But all you're doing is then basically asking people to still continue compromising their immune systems. Unless you are legitimately um, immunocompromised, it just doesn't make sense to me. Me personally, my opinion, just me saying. Now, I appreciate you all sticking with me through this one because I know it's much longer than usual. It's kind of like some of my older videos, but I feel as though I owe it to you since I needed to take a break yesterday. I had, I, I, I just needed a Sunday where I, I took a shower, but I didn't have to put any makeup on. I, I wore sweatpants and well, I'm wearing sweatpants and a sweatshirt right now. So I didn't really count, but I cleaned out my cabinets and I cleaned all the cabinets. I cleaned all the blinds. I did all kinds of stuff. And then I hung out with my kid on the couch and we watched Christmas movies and it was fun. I made some homemade mashed potatoes. Those are always the best. We had rotisserie chicken in the crock pot uh, a couple of videos ago. Everybody's asking what was in the blue crock pot. It was, um, it was chicken. I call it rotisserie chicken. It's not, I did crock pot chicken and then I turned it into barbecue chicken. We had it with homemade mashed potatoes yesterday and I had some some organic uh, green beans and some whatever else. And it was lovely. It was a nice day of just chilling with my family, chilling with my homies. You know what I'm saying? Rolling with the homies. No. Okay. So it was just a lot of fun. So thank you guys for your understanding and continued support. All right. So According to AP, Associated Press, the Pentagon says U.S. warship commercial ships attacked in Red Sea, <laughs> Halfus, 
claim attacking two ships. I don't even know how I'm supposed to say that. Y'all, y'all already know me and my pronunciations of whatnots. Now, an American warship, the USS Kearney, and multiple commercial vessels were attacked in the Red Sea, as reported by the Pentagon. Yemen's Houthi, how Houthi, Houthi, and that's what it is. H o u t h i. I'm pretty sure it's Houthi. Houthi rebels claimed responsibility for attacking two ships linked to Israel, but did not acknowledge targeting the U.S. Navy vessel. This incident marks a significant escalation in maritime attacks in the Middle East, potentially linked to the Israel-Hamas uh, war. Details about the extent of the damage to the vessels are unclear. The British military reported a suspected drone attack and explosions in the Red Sea, but specifics were not provided. Now, the Houthi military uh, spokesman, Brigadier General, I think it's how you do it, Brig Jin, I think it's Brigadier General y- Yah, 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 sorry, man, I'm so bad with names, claimed responsibility for the attacks, stating that the first vessel was hit by a missile and the second by a drone in the Bab al Mandeb Strait. He warned against Israeli or Israeli associated ships navigating the Red Sea and Gulf of Aden. Uh, Sari identified and attacked vessels as the Bahamas flagged Unity Explorer and the P- Panamanian flagged container ship number nine. The Unity Explorer is linked to a British firm with an officer living in Israel, while number nine is linked to Bernhard Schulte Ship Management. Israeli media identified Dan David Ungar, associated with the Unity Explorer, as the son of Israeli shipping billionaire Abraham Rami Ungar. The Houthis have a history of attacking vessels in the Red Sea and targeting Israel with drones and missiles. A U.S. official reported that the USS Kearney intercepted at least one drone during the attack. This escalation in maritime conflict comes amid the ongoing Israel-Hamas war, with global shipping increasingly becoming a target. Surprise, surprise. The collapse of a recent truce and the resumption of Israeli airstrikes and ground offensive have heightened the risk of such attacks. Earlier, the Houthis re- uh, seized a vehicle transport ship linked to Israel in the Red Sea and still hold it near Ho- Hodida. Hodida? Oh, I-, I wish I was better at these, and I'm sorry that I'm not. I don't have the accent to make the words sound right. Um, Missiles also landed near another U.S. warship last week following its assistance to an Israel-linked vessel. The direct targeting of American vessels by the Houthis has not been frequent, but in 2016, the U.S. responded to missile fire at U.S. Navy ships by destroying Houthi-controlled radar sites with cruise missiles. The recent uh, incident thus raises the stakes in the ongoing maritime conflict. I've said it before, and I will say it again. This is why we, as the United States of America, need to work on relying upon ourselves for the things that we need to keep this country going, to keep our citizens fed, to keep the clothes on our backs, to keep our cars running, to keep our houses running, to keep our appliances running, to keep just everything. Because we rely so heavily upon other countries that when it says here, we're going to have shipping issues again, that's, that's what I'm reading out of this, is that we're expected to have shipping issues again. You're going to see more shortages on the shelves, all because we as a country aren't doing more for ourselves. We're relying too heavily on other countries. Does you know the import-export work um, most of the time? Sure it does. But in moments of conflict like this, we need our own fallback if nothing else, where we don't have to rely on trying to get something from across the seas, knowing that then, you know, we're going to have shortages of medication that people rely on because for some reason we get the majority of our medication from China. The same people who don't have the same lead, um, uh, what is the right word? Lead. Mm, Y'all, my brain is not braining. I can't think of the word. I cannot think of the word to save my life right now. Oh, I hate when this happens. It's too much up in here and I can't think of certain words and it literally makes me want to bang my head on the wall. Just as annoying for me as it is for you, I promise you, my dudes. Like, I friggin' hate it. Um, y'all, I cannot think of the word. Whatever. Anyway, we, we, have, we don't have the same requirements. Is that the right word? Expectations? Those aren't the right words, but it's along those lines. Y'all know what I mean. They, they are not on the same wavelength that we are when it comes to safety <laughs> in things for our kids and our, our people. That, and, and I feel like we should quit getting stuff from there. Anyway, I pissed myself off because I couldn't think of the word. I'm sorry. Now, I can't say that these events are closely related, but I am sure that the conflict does play a part in these organizations' decisions and ultimately how they would have an impact and affect you and I in America very, very soon. 
Now, oil prices, good old oil, because of course they're going to do this so that then we have to push for electric stuff, forgetting that it takes oil to still do electric stuff. <laughs> the irony is not lost on me. Oil prices could reach a hundred dollars a barrel in 2024. If OPEC plus there's like a little plus sign members fulfill pledges for voluntary cuts. Oh, mom eyes. Oil prices are expected to rise in the new year after some OPEC plus oil producers voluntarily pledged to cut output. The oil cartel on Thursday, cartel, mm -hmm, on Thursday released a statement that did not formally endorse production cuts. Cartels aren't good things, in case anybody's curious. So OPEC Plus members, led by Saudi Arabia and Russia, have pledged voluntary production cuts totaling 2.2 million barrels per day for the first quarter of 2024. Saudi Arabia will continue its existing cut of $1 million per day, while Russia plans to reduce its supply by 500,000 barrels per day, including crude and petroleum products. Other countries like Iraq, the UAE, Kuwait, uh, Kazakhstan, Algeria, and Oman also announced significant cuts. These cuts, however, were not formally endorsed in a collective OPEC plus statement leading to skepticism and confusion among traders. Each member state issued separate statements regarding their cuts, deviating from the usual process of a unified OPEC plus announcement. Bill Perkins of Schuyler Capital Management emphasized the importance of compliance from all OPEC nations for these cuts to be effective. He noted that the market often distrusts individual nations' uh, commitments on production cuts. The expansion, nope, wrong word, the expectation is that these cuts will lead to a rise in oil prices. Analysts from UBS and Goldman Sachs predict higher prices due to the supply deficit caused by these cuts. UBS notes that the oil market will likely remain in deficit in the first half of 2024, while Goldman Sachs expects Brent oil prices to be maintained in the $80 to $100 range for 2024. As for the latest trading, Brent crude futures were slightly down at $80.66 a barrel, and West Texas intermediate crude futures also showed a small decrease to $75.93 per barrel. Here, here's my thought. You guys ready for this? Um, planned shortages, plain and simple, planned shortages. If they're getting, if they're trying to cut down the production of all these things and cut down the exportation of all of crude oil and petroleum and everything else, it's going to wreak havoc on an already like unstable economy. This is my opinion. I'm not a financial analyst. I am not a healthcare provider. I am not a um, financial expert of any sort. Uh, none of these things but I'm a very opinionated individual if you guys have not figured it out and I have no problem sharing those opinions. I would much rather say my mind and whatever else than, than, you know, just keep my eyes closed, head down and walk around like nothing's going on. So here's the issue with what they're saying is going to happen in the beginning of 2024 with everybody cutting down on their oil production, which means cutting down on oil exports, which means cutting down on our oil imports. You're going to see the same issues we had 2021, 2022. You're going to see the shortages if you will, but it's because we're not going to have the fuel, the whatever else to move uh, trucks, planes, trains, automobiles from point A to point B. You're not going to have the, the, the petroleum and everything else you need to make certain products. Oil and, and things, I mean, it, it literally runs the world. You take it away and it kind of puts a kink in every single thing because it, if it's needed here, it affects here, here, and here, and vice versa. If, it, if, if you're affected over here, it's going to affect all this other stuff. If you can't make this, then there's no need for a delivery driver to pick it up to deliver it because you can't make it. If the delivery driver has no fuel and can't pick it up, there's no point in you making it. It just, it all goes hand in hand. So this is, again, their massive push for us to go electric vehicle hydrogen, all this other stuff. They want to move us away from relying on oil and things like that. And in order to do it, they're going to hurt us in order to make us do it. And the way they're going to hurt us is to say, hey, we could still pump out 2.2 million barrels a day, but we're not gonna. If they have the ability to cut it that much, they have the ability to also make that much. And they're saying we're not going to do it. It is designed to hurt everybody's economy at this point. It's also designed, I think, to make it so that each country can start to hoard things a little bit more for themselves or to charge exponentially more for the things that they are allowing out of their borders. So just keep all of these things in mind as 2024 rolls around and you're wondering why everything has gone up in price again, even though inflation is stalling and everything's better. BS. 
I'm just going to call it the malarkey, the baloney that it is. So just keep that in mind. The rest of this month, I'm not in the beginning, y'all. When I started this channel in the in February, March of 2022, I did it because I was worried about everything that was going on. And I was very big on the stock up as much as you can, get as much as you can, spend as much as you can to get as much as you can. My mind frame has changed since then because I can see what it did. What it did was help out all the manufacturers and hurt the people who went out and spent all their money on all these things, but it kept the economy moving, right? Because they needed us throwing money into it in order for it to continue moving on while they were sitting there trying to just destroy it. So now my brain says you need to have enough on hand, but I don't want people running out and spending every single dime they have to stockpile like they're scared that the end of the world's coming. Because if it is, guess what? You don't need that much of a stockpile, but you do need some things on hand. You do need water. You do need certain um, shelf stable foods and things like that. And you do need, if you have medications that you need to take in order to live, you need to get those now. That is my thought on that. Okay. So that's that. What I can tell you is in fact, this is connected, or better yet, maybe I should say disconnected, and that is Walmart is the latest advertiser to pull ads from Elon Musk's X Twitter. It's you can call it X all day long. Well, if I was still Twitter, it's whatever. But to be quite honest, I don't think Elon really gives a f you. Yeah, y'all know the rest. So now Walmart confirmed that it is abandoning current advertising on the social media platform formerly known as Twitter, now owned by Elon Musk. I'm trying not to hiccup, I'm sorry. The decision is not attributed to a specific, oh, stop hiccup, not attributed to a specific change in Walmart's advertising policy, but they say it is part of a gradual decrease in spending aligned with performance. The platform, referred to as X in uh, the summary, has seen a number of prominent uh, brands pause their advertising following Musk's embrace of an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. Joe Benarock, head of operations at X, emphasized the platform's large user base and online shopping activity, suggesting Walmart's decision is not directly related to Musk's actions. But come on, let's be real here. I mean, honestly... Walmart remains active on X in other ways, continuing to connect organically with its community, but just without giving a split of it to Elon. Okay. And Musk responding to the withdrawal of advertisers expressed indifference and refused to be influenced by financial pressure, blackmail, or extortion with some choice words the other night. I don't know if you guys have seen it, but choice, choice words. The advertising withdrawal includes major media companies like Disney, Paramount, NBC Universal, Comcast, Lionsgate, and Warner Brothers uh, Discovery. Walmart's decision is part of a broader trend, and the company will continue advertising on other social media platforms like TikTok and Instagram. I mean, you know, sometimes I just want to say it too. So here's the thing. Walmart, <laughs> they could take their advertising away completely as far as I'm concerned, but they have been advertising on Facebook. And I've mentioned this to you guys in previous videos. They advertise on Facebook all the time, but the, the downside is they're letting their third party vendors advertise on Facebook. A lot of the times it's got Walmart logo up there, but some of the things that are being advertised are not okay. In my opinion on, um, I don't know if Facebook's considered supposed to be considered a family friendly platform or anything like that. I'm not quite sure, but some of the things that Walmart is advertising right now, I don't think Walmart knows are being advertised because if they were, they'd be like, Oh no, we can't do that. There have been some very skeezy, shysty things on there. Just, just so you know, I'm sure you guys have seen, I actually have a post up on my Instagram if anybody's interested in it of some, some of the things that showed up as Walmart advertising. Now, but experts comment that Musk's leadership style has significantly impacted the platform, driving away a primary revenue source and insider intelligence projected a substantial fall in X's global ad revenues for the year. The ongoing boycott is unique in that it centers around reputational concerns and uncertainties of doing business with Musk rather than content issues. Hold on, let me get re comfortable here. Sorry. Now Musk recent video uh, visit to Israel was not deemed an apology tour either. As he stated, it was not a response to the advertising boycott and he emphasized his integrity, but stated he wouldn't conform to expectations to prove his character. I don't know about Elon Musk personally. There's some things I like about the guy. There's some things I don't like about the guy. He's hit or miss sometimes, but 
I do appreciate his ability to stand behind who he is without bending to what people want him to be. Personally, I, I, I like that kind of thing. I don't, I don't want to call it integrity. Maybe that's what it is, but maybe it's not or character. I'm not quite sure what to call that, but I'm, I'm okay with it. So now here, this leads me to my next question. Elon Musk has put his foot down and knows where he stands and will not allow himself to conform to expectations driven and incentivized by greed and monetary compensation. Can the same be said for the current commander in chief, our fearless leader, President Joseph R. Biden Jr. Just because he can't walk upstairs or walk downstairs or read or talk without a teleprompter telling him what to say, I'm just saying. Only time will tell as we can already see his fall from grace as he continues to make one more wrong move after the next. Group of swing state Muslims vows to ditch Biden in 2024 over his war stance. Muslim community leaders from several key swing states have publicly withdrawn their support for U.S. President Joe Biden, expressing dissatisfaction with his handling of the Israel-Hamas conflict, particularly his refusal to call for a ceasefire in Gaza. The sentiment was voiced at a conference in suburban uh, Detroit, Michigan, a state with a significant Arab American population. Leaders from Michigan, Minnesota, Arizona, Wisconsin, Florida, Georgia, Nevada, and Pennsylvania expressed their discontent under a banner stating, Abandon Biden, cease fire now. The growing dissatisfaction within the American Muslim community could potentially impact the 2024 presidential election as these states are pivotal in determining the outcome. The attention stems from the high casualty toll in the Israel-Hamas war with the health ministry in Gaza reporting a death toll of 15,200 Palestinians, most of whom are women and minors and around 1,200 Israelis. Biden's reluctance to advocate for a ceasefire has been perceived as a betrayal by many who supported him in the 2020 election, causing deep frustration and anger within the Muslim community. Um, Jelani Hussein, a Minneapolis-based Muslim leader and organizer of the conference, emphasized the community's disappointment and its potential political implications. He highlighted the community's power, not just in financial terms, but also in terms of votes, signaling a shift in their support away from Biden. The White House, through spokesperson Andrew Bates, has defended Biden's stance, highlighting his efforts to push for humanitarian pauses and his commitment to fighting anti-Semitism and supporting Israel's right to self-defense. Despite the Muslim community leader's disapproval of Biden, this does not translate into support for former President Donald Trump or any other specific candidate. Instead, Hussein underlines um, that the community sees multiple options and is prepared to exercise their vote strategically. This development reflects a significant shift in the political landscape, considering the Muslim demographics previous leaning towards the Democratic Party. Now... 2024 election, no matter how you look at it, it's going to be interesting. I think it's going to be interesting. You've got people dropping out of the race like flies. I cannot remember the guy they just said dropped out who had no snowball's chance in hell of even making it, but I don't remember his name. Um, but you have people dropping out left and right. And once it comes down to it, do we get four more years of whatever the hell we're in right now? Or do we switch it up and get four years of something new, whether it's a new Democrat or a new Republican or an old Republican that we've had before that, you know what I'm saying? So who knows which way this is going to go? I do know there's a lot, a lot going on right now. So much going on right now. And I will say that I'm not, I'm not liking, I don't know how to phrase this, the fact that Oh, it's going to sound wrong no matter how I phrase it. So here we go. Y'all ready? I don't love the fact that outside sources could determine which route our country goes. I don't know how else to phrase that where I'm not going to get just all kinds of dinged over here. So I don't know how else to phrase that. Listen, Scroll Tribe. This is the longest video I've done in a very long time. Hopefully you've made it to the end. If not, <laughs> you don't hear anything I'm saying anyway, so it doesn't really matter. But for those of you who did, I love you all immensely. I appreciate you all beyond belief, just so you know. Um, got my water in my little Christmas cup here. It's supposed to be for wine, but it's just water because talking for an hour will make you thirsty. So there's that. Um, 
I do have more to bring you guys later today, but I'm going to let this one go first and hopefully you guys like it, learn something, have some comments for me. Let me know your thoughts and opinions on these things over here. There is a link in the description to Patreon. If you would like to go over there and support the channel on a different platform, if not again, no harm, no foul. I still love you either way. And I guess I will see you guys again later. Have a fabulous Monday, my dudes. Bye.